kuecho. The President, uh, the court is now back in session. Without further ado, we would like to now hand over to councils for the civil party to continue putting questions. Council Hong Kum Soon, thank you, Mr. President. I have only two more questions left to put to the witness. Regarding K-1 office, do you still recall the names of the senior leaders who attended the meeting? Response. I do not recall exactly people from which rank who attended the meetings. At the same time, I don't even remember their names. Nonetheless, I learned from my peers or colleagues who gathered uh, inside the premises who would come and tell us after the meeting that the, the meeting was uh, attended by leaders from all across the country. And uh, knowing this, uh, I had the reason to know this as well because before such a meeting, we would be asked uh, to be prepared to give protection for the people who attended meetings. Yet uh, we were not informed uh, about the names of individuals who attended those meetings. The message we received was just brothers from the zones attending the meetings. Question. Apart from Pol Pot, Nun Chi, Ying Sari, Kyo Sampan, and other, do you still remember some people from the zones who attended the meetings? Just a few of them, if you can, if you can't. Just say so. Response. I remember some people's name, including Uncle Sao Pum from the East, East Zone. I heard of him. And Tamok from the Southwest Zone. So these are the two individuals whose names I had heard about very often. Question, uh, what about people from the State Presidium? Do you remember any persons from that section? Response, I have no idea. I did not know whether anyone from the state presidium coming to the meeting other than Kyo Sum Pan, who was the president of the state presidium at the meeting. I have the final question, please. Uh, this question relates to the then Prince Norodom Sihanouk. Were you aware whether senior Khmer leaders ever mentioned about the prince's good deeds during the Khmer Rouge regime? Response, no, I didn't. I did not hear anything about this. Council Hong Kong Soon, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, 
Mr. Witness, I have no further questions, and I would like to cede the floor to my colleague to continue putting questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honours. Good afternoon to everyone in and around the courtroom. Good afternoon, Mr. Sovi. My name is Beni Yi. I am one of the International Civil Party lawyers, and I would like to ask you just very few questions. First, I would like to talk about the time around the 17th of April 1975, when, as you said, you saw evacuees from Phnom Penh arriving in your district. Can you give us an estimate of how many evacuees you saw, you saw at that time? Response. It is difficult for me to give you an estimate number of uh, evacuees. I saw a lot of people coming to Po Ongkrong commune and I can't say this because I saw some uh, a lot of people going to that commune but there, w there are other communes uh, within the district uh, that I was located so people could also be evacuated to those locations. Thank you. And over how many days did you see people arriving from Phnom Penh at that time? Response. Over three days. Uh, after these three days, uh, less and less people were seen coming to the location. Thank you. Now, earlier on, you said that the village chief helped the evacuees to settle in the sector. My question is, could the people, could these evacuees choose the location to be settled in? response. I don't know about this. I don't know whether people had any right to choose where to settle in. I saw them being made uh, to stay in the neighborhood uh, area, but when it comes to their choice, I don't know. Thank you. Do you know whether the families at that time were staying together or if they were separated? Response. So far as I know, they were not uh, separated. They stayed uh, together for that short period of time that I observed. Earlier today, you said that you learned that people were assigned tasks. Um, what kind of tasks were these evacuees assigned to do? Response. The evacuees had to do the same tasks uh, or perform the same tasks as the local people did. Uh, so they couldn't choose to do any other task other than the one the local villagers did. And could you tell us who assigned these tasks to them? Response. The village chiefs and the commune chiefs, who would be the persons 
assigning these tasks to them. And do you know if there was an order coming from above to those village chiefs to assign these tasks? Response. No, I don't. Thank you. I would like to come now to a different period, the time where you worked at K1. You said earlier that during this time you observed a number of people disappearing. Can you tell us during what period you observed these people disappearing? Response. I observed people disappearing after they had been educated, refashioned time and, t and again, but still they could not change. So after that they had uh, been removed. To me, they had been removed because uh, they had not refashioned themselves. It doesn't mean that they had been disappearing because they committed uh, treason. Or to put it simply, they failed to follow the Anka discipline. And that was part of the punishment, the punishment in which they were removed to work elsewhere. Thank you. And did this happen throughout the entire time where you were stationed at K-1? <coughs> Response. Yes, uh, it happened uh, uh, throughout the entire time, all the way to 1979. And how frequent were these disappearances during that time? Response. It was not uh, very frequent, and uh, there were not many cases either. Only few people had been relocated or transferred to different locations uh, for this p uh, problem. Thank you. Now I come to my last question. You mentioned before that after the fall of the regime, of the Khmer Rouge regime, you heard a speech by Bob Bot mentioning um, his view of the time of the democratic Cambodia. My question is, did you ever hear speeches on the Democratic Cambodia from other senior leaders? Response. No, I didn't. I heard a speech made by Pol Pot alone when he made it right before the bodyguards group. Thank you very much, Mr. Sovi. I have no further questions, and I wish you a good journey back home. The President. Thank you, Council. Fellow judges of the bench, would you wish to put some questions to the witness? I know that uh, my fellow judges do not have any questions. Uh, we would like now to hand over to counsels for Mr. Kilsenpon to put questions uh, to this witness first uh, before the other two teams. Counsel Kung Sumon. Thank you, Mr. President and Your Honours. Good afternoon, Mr. So we I am Kung Sumon representing Kilsenpon along with my colleague. I have very few questions. 
and the purpose of these questions are to seek uh, some clarifications concerning your testimony for the whole morning and this afternoon. You worked as a guard at K1 office. My question to you is, uh, when did you start working at K1 and when did you finish this task? Response. I started working at a K1 immediately in early 1976 and I stopped uh, working there by 1979 when we fled Phnom Penh. Question. Regarding the guard post or the location where you stood guard at K1, you said you worked at the second layer. Can you emphasize your impression concerning the place uh, from where you stood? What could you see? Response. We could not see anything inside the building, inside the premises. We saw only a few stories that were higher above. So the view were, our view was blocked by the planks wall. So we couldn't see the lower stories of the building. But we can say uh, that uh, we could see only from one angle of the building. The building was a square concrete uh, building, but we could only see just from one corner or one from one angle. Question. Did you change uh, your guard post uh, very often or you remain in one place all along? Response. On some occasions, we had to move to different guard posts or tower. We had four towers and we would uh, take turn to station at different tower every now and then. Question. How long would it take uh, for your for you and other people to move to other post or what was the period of time how often response uh, we would uh, change post uh, once every two, uh, two weeks or 15 days question you also stated about kill some pawns we are called you indicated that uh, you saw Kilsom Pond using Lambrata vehicle. Can you describe to the chamber, please, what this vehicle was like? Response Lambrata vehicle had four wheels four small wheels. He would uh, take it to go to K1. Question. You mentioned that this vehicle had four wheels. Uh, can you describe the wheels to the chamber? Were they a kind of wheels like the normal wheels of every car or like the wheels of Tuk Tuk? Response. Uh, the wheels uh, are the car wheels, not motorcycles wheels. Question.
can you describe also its engine and the capacity or horsepower of the engine, whether it was functioning like the other vehicle? Response. I don't know the capacity of the engine, but I know that he took this Amprata vehicle to work, and to me, it was the cheapest uh, means of transportation. It was very humble for him to take uh, such a vehicle to work when the other people would take fancy cars or vehicles to work. Question. Can you also describe to us whether you know the driver of Mr. Kilsompon and other who drove him to work? Response. As I recall, Sun was his driver. It's been a long while I called a mistake with the name. Thank you. Question. Do you know any person by the name of Hoon? Response. No, I cannot recall anyone by that name. Question to the person by the name of Soon, as you mentioned, how old was he at that time, and what was his uh, particulars? Response, he was a few years older than me. He, has, uh, he had light complexion, but he's uh, shorter than me. Questioned, did you know the driver of the Lambretta for Mr. Kilson Pond personally? Response, yes, I did. I spoke with him. We had a contact when he came to have meal together with me. Questioned. Do you know about his uh, driving experience? Respond. The, the drivers were properly trained. Question. In view of other drivers, Soon, the person that you said, the driver of Mr. Kirsten Pond, had a better experience. Response. I believe his uh, driving experience was inferior than to other drivers. He did receive a driving course, but uh, he only began driving for kill some pond. So it could mean that he had less experience than drivers for other leaders. Question, when you saw kill some pond and his driver, that is soon, did you see Kiss and Paul was with anybody else in that Lambretta? Response, I only saw him and his driver. Question, did Mr. Kiss and Paul have his own personal bodyguard? Response, I only saw him and the driver when he came in and uh, went out of the office. I have another question regarding 
when Mr. Kieran Pond fled after 1979. I objected to the question put to you by the prosecutor as it failed out of the scope of jurisdiction of this chamber. However, it was overruled and the prosecutor proceeded with his question. Now I'd like to expand on that point regarding the situation surrounding the time that Kiel Sampon left Phnom Penh after 1979 and went to stay together with Pol Pot. My question is the following. Based on your knowledge, from 1975 to 1979, that is during the power of the Democratic Cambodia and the period after 1979, when Democratic Cambodia was toppled, What was the change regarding the management or the administration in particular in regards to what you personally knew or observed? Response. The situation was different the living condition and the leadership management after 1979 was different from that of the previous regime. While they were in power in during the Democratic Cambodia regime in Phnom Penh, the leadership was of a different style. I have two points to raise, that is regarding the leadership in between 75 to 79, and it is the following. I knew very little regarding the matters at that time. I could, however, say that the style of leadership was somewhat different from the time that the regime was toppled. When they were in full power, they had proper administrative structure from the top level up to the village level. So everybody was aware of the method and how they controlled the country. Everyone is well aware of that. That is their leadership while they were in power. I personally, as one of the guards living there and uh, providing a protection to the uh, Kevin office, I did not know the details of how they administered the regime. As I stated from the outset, this is in relation to their management of the country while they were in power between 75 to 79. And after they lost their power, that is after 1979, when they fled to the jungle to form another resistance, the leadership form was different, the way they lived, the way they led, were different. They had different approach in tackling the issue of leadership in how they managed to survive in the uh, jungle as there were no longer vehicles for them to use no big buildings or offices for them to work or to reside. And sometimes they had to travel on rough road to go down to the 
through waterfall, for instance, to meet with the uh, local people. And the construction of the country was no longer mentioned as in the previous regime. The main theme at the time was to form a coalition in order to resist the invaders to rescue the country. So that style or kind of leadership was different from that of the 75-79 period. That is all, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Sovi. I do not have any further questions for you. However, my colleague will ask you some questions. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon, witness. My name is Arthur Verken, and I am uh, one of the international counsels uh, for Mr. Kessampan. So I also have a few follow-up questions to put to you. And the first one of these questions centers on the meetings, which you spoke about this morning, by the way, meetings that were held at K1 and that brought together the zone and uh, sector leaders, and you spoke about these meetings, and you explained to the prosecutors that you remember these meetings particularly clearly, because during these meetings, you were asked to clean the way to the meetings and and to make and to stand guard for the people attending. So my question f is on the frequency of these meetings. Based on your observations, can you tell us? How many times per year such meetings uh, took place based on what you uh, observed? Based on my observation, such a meeting was held uh, frequently throughout the year. It's impossible to put it in exact number, but it was held uh, frequently. And when you were questioned by the investigators on 5 December 2007, you said that these meetings took place once every three or once every six months. So do you still agree with this? Do you agree? Uh, w does this correspond to what uh, you remember? In my record of interview with the investigators in December 2007 at my house, I stand by that record of interview mainly. And if there are a few minor points which could be inconsistent, are the result of my personal conclusion, as sometimes I am unsure as well. And for that reason, I made my personal conclusion. Now I would like to put a question to you about uh, the frequency of uh, Pons presence at K1. My question is the following. Based on what you observed, are you able to make a distinction or not between the frequency of Kusompon's presence at K1 and that of the other leaders you mentioned, such as uh, Nunchia, Yeng Sari, or others? Are you able or not to tell us that Kyusonpan came more often or less often than the others, or is this something that goes beyond your recollection?
it is my observation that he went there more frequent than other leaders. Fine. And you said a few minutes ago that uh, from the perimeter where you were standing guard, you could notice or you would not, in fact, be able to see the first floors of the main building of K1. And therefore, I'd like to ask you if, however, you would be able to describe to us the top of this building, and in particular the roof, was it a, a building with a classical roof or was it a modern building with a flat roof? When I looked at the upper floor, The roof was not uh, made of the tile roof as uh, we had today. It was the roof was made of uh, concrete. That's how I can recall it. And was this roof uh, flat, or was it angled, such? as uh, in a pagoda, for example, or in a classical house. Do you remember that? Madam. It was a flat concrete roof. Are you able to tell us how many floors uh, this building had? Based on my estimation, there could be four to five floors of that building. Are you able to tell us if there were kitchens in this building and if uh, these cooking areas were within or without uh, or outside of the building? I did not know about the, the kitchen, whether it was inside the building or not, because I did not enter the building uh, to look around the compound. Yeah. Well, in fact, uh, based on the fact that you never entered uh, the building or even the perimeter around the building. Can you give us more details? Was this forbidden? Was it forbidden for you to enter the compound or, or during those years you had no reason to go into this uh, uh, compound or were you actually forbidden from going into the compound? The building was prohibited even if the guards working at the first layer without permission would be prohibited from entering the building. I was at the second layer. However, there was no strict prohibition from going to the first layer. In fact, it was not prohibited, but it was our responsibility that we did not go there because we did not have any duty to go there. And when, for example, 
you would come together for training sessions or for self-criticism meetings, and when your superiors would uh, preside over these meetings, where did these meetings take place? The meetings, namely the self-criticism meetings, were held at the group level. And in fact, it was the group chief who organized such a meeting. And where did these meetings take place? It took place about 10 to 20 meters from the guard post. Sometimes it was held under the tree. And sometimes it lasted for about half an hour only. Now I would like to ask you to clarify one of the answers you gave to us this morning when you were questioned by the prosecutors, and it appeared to me, at least based on the translation, th you said to us that your work consisted mainly in uh, night duty. So I would like now to give you the opportunity to tell me if I understood properly uh, what, was underst what was translated. So were your guard shifts mainly night shifts, or, uh, was, or would you alternate? Can you give us some clarification on this? Regarding the work at the second layer, I was actually on a mobile shift, and usually I patrolled during the night at that perimeter, there were two groups on patrol. As for the tower guard, sometimes our group replaced the other group who was supposed to guard at the tower. However, some other times we also were assigned the duty to guard at those uh, four posts or four towers. And mainly we patrol at night. We were on foot patrolling at the, at, within the perimeter. And sometimes we were assigned to assist the other guard units based on the instructions from the group chief or the unit chief. Thank you for this clarification. I'm going to, however, ask you to be even more precise because I don't really understand from your answer if your job consisted in working during the day as well as in working during the night or if you only worked at night or if you only worked during the day. Can you be more specific about when exactly uh, you were on duty as a guard? At, during the day, we took shift to alternate at the four posts or towers, and at night, we patrolled. We walked on foot engaged in patrolling. These were the two main duties that I regularly engaged in. And while we patrolled at night, we did not patrol through the entire night we took shift. In fact, we patrol at night for only two hours, then another team would replace us, and then we would rest. 
And during the day when we were assigned by the group chief or the unit chief to guard any particular tower, we would take up that position there. But mainly we were assigned to guard the entrance where the leaders or the uncles would go in the, to work in the office. You explained uh, to us, and again this morning, that the person in charge of the first and second perimeter was called Tan. Is that so? Is that true? Yes, that is correct. And when you were questioned by the investigators in 2007, you said to them that you gave them the alias of this uh, gentleman. Do you remember what the revolutionary name of Tan was? Can you tell us again? He was known also as Q. So Tan alias Q. But when he was in the jungle, people only called him by Tan. He was no longer called Q. But while he was uh, at K1 office during the regime, he was called Q. But I am not sure whether Q was his revolutionary name. Well, this morning, you were reminded of this by the prosecutors, and uh, the court heard the statement of someone whose name was provided to you this morning, and it is public, Mr. Untan, and, and Untan's st statement leads us to believe that uh, Untan was this Mr. Tan, except that... Untan only acknowledged having one alias, alias, Shu. So my question is the following. Was this so named Untan or Tan or Q was also called Shu? Maybe there is a difficulty in the way I'm pronouncing it, so I'll let me spell it out. Uh, in uh, the French version, it is written C-H-O-U, chou, like cabbage in French. No, I did not hear that name. I don't know, maybe currently while he was while he is living in some load he is known by another name as a Chu. He could have changed his name uh, later on. While I was in the jungle he was only known as Tan. And during the time that we were at the K one office he was known as Q. But I do not know anything about the name of the person uh, Chu. And when um, Mr. Untan was heard, he was questioned about uh, your statement. So we, he was provided with your name, and he said that he did not know you. So does that seem to you to be plausible or... Is it plausible in your eyes that uh, Mr. Ung Tan could have forgotten you? Uh, 
I do not believe that he doesn't know me. Though I don't know what he stated, but I don't believe that, because he and I lived together for quite a long time. We spent more time together than not. It started since 1976 until at least 1996, when I returned to live in Thailand while he still remained in some load. <laughs> so we had stayed together for a long time, and I don't believe that he doesn't know me. However, if he Stated that he doesn't know me. That is his own discretion. Lorsque vous avez été entendu, vous. When you were interviewed, you explained that Mr. Tan had denounced his predecessor as a traitor. You also explained that. When he wrote to the headquarters to ask that they would take over from his Sen, he was the one who had the authority to summon people to appear. Since you made that statement, Mr. Untan was asked whether that was true, and he denied it. Is it possible that you? Made a mistake by saying that Tan had denounced Sen, and that he had the authority to summon people whose conduct was subject to criticism to appear. What the response? I'm afraid I don't know about this because it's their own business. J'entends bien que vous pouvez faire cette. I do understand that you can give the answer you've just given, but can you confirm that in 2007 you made the statement I have just referred to? Response: No, I don't. Uh Really discredit my statement before the co-investigators. I still stand by my statement. I have no idea about uh, whether Dan uh, talked anything about Sam. I I think uh, I don't know anything about this. The president, uh, thank you, counsel. Um, can you please advise the chamber as to how much time you would like to uh, take to put questions to this witness, please? Au maximum, une vingt. At the very most, twenty minutes, Mr. President. The president, uh, what about? Councils uh, for Mr. Nun Chie, how much time would you prefer to put questions to this witness? Council Sonarun. Thank you, Mr. President and Your Honours. I am Sonarun, and my colleague uh, do not have any questions to put to Mr. Sawi. The President, Council for Mr. Ying Siri, could you please advise the Chamber as to how much time you would need? Council. Mr. President, I may need uh, five minutes the most.
the president councils may take um, a rather long period of time to put questions uh, to the witness and we believe that uh, we are now um, at the end of the session already so it is now appropriate time for the adjournment the next session will be resumed uh, tomorrow at 9 a.m. and councils uh, will have the opportunity to finish putting questions uh, to Mr. Witness. After the testimony of Mr. Sawi is concluded, uh, we proceed to hear the testimony of TCW 754. Mr. Sawi, your testimony has not yet uh, been complete. Uh, the Chamber would like uh, to invite you to the courtroom tomorrow to give the testimony at 9 a.m. And we believe that uh, it will not take long for councils to put questions to you. Court officer is now instructed to assist uh, the witness during the adjournment and have him return to the courtroom by 9 a.m. when the next session resumes. Security personnel are now instructed to bring Mr. Kilsom Pon, Nguyen Chi, and Yang Sari to the detention facility and have them return to the courtroom by tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Mr. Yang Sari is instructed to be returned to the holding cell only where he can observe the proceedings from there. The court is adjourned.